Welcome everyone to the monthly Q&A and I also want to thank um, my Patreon supporters uh, right from the beginning for all of the tremendous support they provide. It's much appreciated and I want you to understand that I'm doing my best uh, to uh, put your support into action both in the production of uh, videos. Um, I, as many of you know, i am also been hosting a live uh, meditation and contemplation and Qigong uh, Sangha, uh, a course, class, um, every weekday morning at 9.30 a.m. Um, so um, I'm currently uh, doing work on and uh, trying to obtain uh, funding for uh, the next series uh, after Socrates. So there's a, uh, there's a lot that's been done. Uh, I've been publishing some uh, book chapters uh, with uh, Christopher Master Pietro and articles. So I want you to know that I am wor I'm working very diligently and I believe honestly very responsibly uh, with the support that you provided me to try and turn it into, um, I guess, products, services. Oh, that sounds so capitalistic. Anyways, uh, uh, things that will benefit uh, people um, at large um, as they attempt to wrestle uh, with the meaning crisis and the meta crisis. So I wanted to assure you that I am working very hard and I have feel I, I feel that the last while has actually been uh, very, very productive uh, in terms of being able to uh, afford people in transformation and in dip deeper discourse and deeper connection with each other. So thank you once again for enabling me to help um, uh, 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 so many other people. I, I'm very grateful and appreciative. So um, what we'll be doing today is this is our regular general Q&A uh, and we will be first taking questions from the Patreon supporters. Uh, we will then take questions that have been texted in and then finally we will take any uh, questions that are being um, uh, sent in right now uh, via chat. Um, so let's get to the first question and this is from a very devoted um, and I mean that in a positive sense of the word uh, uh, participant uh, within the, the, the Sangha, it's Karima. I believe Karima is also active on the Discord server. Well, that's another thing that has been set up by Brett. And hopefully I'll get a chance to talk about that for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. There's a Discord server uh, around uh, Awakening for the Meaning Crisis and Voices with Raveki and the Meditation and Contemplation course. So Karima is involved with all of this and she is uh, she's an important participant um, and so Karima asks, um, well, so first of all, she makes a statement and then she follows it up with a question. She said, we will not survive without adopting soulful living. As the soul of humanity awakens, the unfoldment of higher consciousness will change civilization to a new era based on wholeness, interrelatedness, and oneness. Can you not kickstart the religion that's not a religion on a simple premise of recognizing with reverence and awe that we have a soul? Uh, thank you. Uh, so this is a very uh, pertinent question um, Kareem is asking because there have been um, a series of discussions, one with Paul Vanderclay, another one with Andrew Sweeney and Christopher Matro Pietro, and also overlapping uh, with some discussions with Jordan Hall where I've been exploring uh, this topic, um, the topic of soul. So there's a term that I've uh, adopted for trying to describe this methodology. It's not my term. It's so, uh, Kerry has a book on Augustine's invention of the inner self, but he, he says he dislikes the title. The book's published in English, but he dislikes the title because the English word invention is not what he wants. He actually wants the Latin term inventio because the Latin word inventio actually um, straddles the distinction between inventing something and discovering something which is actually very pertinent for a sort of a Neoplatonic framework, which Augustine belonged to. Um, and so I've sort of co-opted this with the term of reinventio. And so what I've been exploring in the Dialogos is the notion of the reinventio of soul. Um, and the way I've tried to understand it is in, uh, instead of, I've tried to sort of put aside the metaphysical and ontological heritage, baggage, depending on how you want to view it, and try to get uh, a sense of it again from a phenomenological functional 
And the idea that I have been exploring in Dialogos is that there is a capacity we have to come into a relationship between the moreness of reality that is afforded by the fact that reality is ultimately combinatorially explosive, as Spinoza liked to say, um, that it has infinite attributes. Um, so between the moreness and then something that Collingwood made um, really clear and apparent um, in his philosophy of aesthetics and art, and I think it's deeply convergent with the a, a Buddhist notion, of, which is this notion of suchness, that everything, even this rock has a, 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 a it has a particularity an identity as the term is a suchness a here nowness that is non-categorical there's a way in which this is even if it's a stone even if it's a black rock there's a way in which it is unlike all the other members in that category and as those of you who have uh, followed the series you know that i'm talking about relating to this not in the having mode of having it as a rock but uh, in the being mode right? Relating to it almost like a thou. I'm not calling it a person, but what I'm trying to get at is its particular suchness. Please be patient with me. I'm trying to get somewhere with this because I'm trying to get at how we can bring back an important notion. Um, so if you think of the moreness as an experience of the mystery of participation, the way we are coupled to a combinatorial explosive reality. And you can think of the suchness as the mystery of our individuation, how our relevance realization is self-evolving in a way that right never, never can be fully captured. I can never fully bring my process of framing into any frame. So there, there's a mystery to my suchness and how I individuate. And of course, Jung made a great deal of this. Uh, there's a mystery to my, right? There's a mystery to the moreness and how I participate. And there are states of being in which those are put into right relationship, almost like a stereoscopic vision. And Tai Chi talks about this, right? The eye that looks out and the eye that looks in, or Eckhart talks about this, the eye by which I see God is the same eye by which God sees me. So the idea here is we have a capacity to bring about this kind of, and I'm using this as a metaphor, vision. And it strikes me that that's deeply resonant with um, the work of the philosopher theologian, Paul Tillich, who talked about we're always in a tonos, a creative tension, uh, opponent processing uh, between individuation and participation. This is why I, th I prefer Tillich over Jung, because Tillich, I think, sees more correctly the existential relationship that we're in. And so I think of soul as that about us that lives that tension, that lives that tonos, that allows us to phenomenologically experience the connectedness, the moreness into suchness and the suchness into moreness. And I think it's important to revivify or reinventio this sense of what it is to know, not as a belief, but participatory knowing, know that you have a soul as distinct from the way we have come to think of what our self, what a self is, or what a mind is. And so I think that if we come to understand this, we, we can come to understand that in addition to the ethical and existential commitments I have to you because you have a mind, and I'm deeply aware of these and I'm committed to them because I'm a teacher. I take seriously, you know, we, there was an expression at one time where we were talking about the value of education when I was growing up, that a mind is a terrible thing to waste. There, there's reverence and awe for, for the human mind. And I think what we're, we're, what we're seeing in our culture right now is we're trying to get a sense of what is the pr appropriate reverence and awe for what a, what a self is. And we're very unclear about it and we're wrestling with it. But I think what the religious traditions in their various ways 
have also tried to get us to remember, in the sense of sati, get us to remember, right, that we should have reverence and awe for this capacity of, of soul. And what's what's particularly interesting about that is it seems to be, it seems to be self-reflective. What do I mean by that? Not only is soul something for which I should have reverence and awe, soul is exactly the capacity that is I uh, that I am um, relying on that is affording the experience of awe, the experience of beauty, the experience of wonder. It's particularly the way in which we can get a sense of how the true, the good, and the beautiful actually converge in some way that we only have an inkling for. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure that I completely agree with uh, uh, Karima's sense that um, there's the that there's a sort of a worldwide awakening occurring, or that. Um, this is a sufficient thing, but I do agree with the idea that trying to reinventio, because this is all of these are going through reinventio. Reinventio, what mind means, what cognition means, that's 4E cognitive science. Reinventio, what self means, that's why we're doing all this work on modal confusion and the agent, uh, the agent arena relationship. And now reinventio, what Sorry, what self means. That's the reinventio of the self is the, all that work on the agent arena relationship. And then the, the reinventio of soul as trying to help us to cultivate the virtue of reverence for the experience of awe, these experiences of awe and wonder that are so important to us, but we don't know why. They're so important to us because they're soulful, just like other things are wonderful. They're soulful to us because they disclose to us the deepest possibilities of what we are. And notice how these three reinventios are so deeply interconnected together. The reinventio of mind and 4E cognitive science, the reinventio of self and the whole agent arena idea and modal existence and overcoming modal confusion, and the reinventio of soul as this capacity, this fundamental existential ponos that most develops our humanity and personhood. Um, so I would say that that interconnected manifold of the reinventio of mind, self, and soul is central uh, to uh, the religion that's not a religion. I know there are, there are people that are important in this community, uh, like Brett, who are at times un, uh, unhappy with a, a religious term that carries with it all kinds of metaphysical baggage, like souls or sort of ghosts trapped inside your body or, or, or stuff like that, which I'm not in any way advocating. I, I, have, I understand that, and I do appreciate that. The thing is, I can't find a good alternative for that term. And I do want to pick up, like I did with the term religio, I do want to pick up respectfully uh, that religious and spiritual heritage, but I want to vector it into something, as Karima is foreseeing, that could possibly afford what is needed for the religion that's not a religion. We have to break up this idea of the monolithic mind that we got from Descartes, that a completely self-enclosed computational machine that is just in the head and doesn't go through any significant uh, developmental transformation. And that when it reasons, it's a completely monologic thing. We have to break up that whole monolithic uh, 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 monad idea of who and what we are. Um, and so to the degree to which the reinventio of these three, and more than these three, but these three especially, uh, mind, self, and soul, um, can be undertaken, I think it is, I don't know if it's necessary, but it seems to me, it seems to me very important, perhaps indispensable uh, for trying to bring about uh, what we're trying to bring about with the religion that's not a religion. That was a long answer uh, because it was a very important question, and it's really uh, and you can you can sense that I, I'm caught between something that is very much drawing me, but also hesitancy because this is something that I'm still in the process of wrestling with, and, and you know, and I'm really appreciative of the forum that Andrew Andrew Sweeney is providing. You know that Chris and I and uh, and him and uh, he and I and Zach where we're trying to do 
explore in deep dialogos all of this reinventio um, and a, a, a deeply integrated and coordinated fashion. So I want to thank Andrew publicly right now for for doing that, um, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. Okay, so let's try and move on to the next question. Uh, Mackenzie Levitt, who's also a patron, it's good to hear from you, Mackenzie. Uh, what are your thoughts on the book Film Life of Pi and its relationship to the meaning crisis? This is a wonderful question. I highly recommend uh, the film. Um, I found the film just aesthetically to be one of the most beautiful films I've see seen in my life. I believe it was Ang Lee, the, the director, but I might be misremembering. And if so, I, I apologize to the person who actually directed it. I mean, I, I'm not aware of the cinematographer. I don't remember. But The Life of Pi... Um, does something really, really beautiful because it brings out a contrast to my mind in such an aesthetically powerful, aesthetically attractive manner. It brings out a distinction that is actually central to the meaning crisis. So I don't know how to do this without spoilers. So um, I'm just going to have to apologize. Uh, don't listen for the next 10 minutes if you haven't seen the movie or read the book and you intend to because there's no way for me to talk about it this in depth at this point. Uh, without there being a bit of a spoiler. So let's talk about the movie, because I think this will be more accessible to more people. Right? So the movie seems to be centering around this question about how to think about God. Well, that's, you know, wow. And, you know, there's, and the, 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 the thing is, this is like when you're doing sort of uh, meditative questioning, and you pick questions that present lots of obvious answers, and, the, and you're not supposed to just sort of reject those answers. Oh, no. But you're not supposed to accept them either. You're supposed to tr treat them as portals and see through them to what they portend. Um, and that's the kind of question, that's the way we should relate to this question. Because, of course, a lot of obvious answers come up. Because our culture is shouting lots of obvious answers around us all the time. So what the book does is it, it instead of sort of confronting all of that, it sort of goes, yes, but, and it, sorry, the movie and the book. Right. So what, what it does is it says, okay, this question, how to think about God. And then instead, the person tells a story, right? It tells a story of Pi. And it's the adult version of this boy who was given the nickname Pi. And, it, right? and, he, and the adult is telling the story of this very uh, heroic story in the Jungian sense of a hero, a boy who's and then a shipwrecked and is trapped in a lifeboat with a tiger and some other animals, and especially the relationship right to tigers. Um, and you know, and you think of Blake's tiger, tiger burning bright. So there's all the all those illusions, all of this deeply archetypal stuff is being alluded to. And you go through this whole story, and you see this, and the, and, the, and the boy is going through, he's an adolescent, he's going through these fundamental transformations in his confrontation with these animals, these sort of archetypal animals, but most especially uh, the tiger, and with himself, and of course with the sea. And then the world is, right, it's almost like a union synchronicity, um, although I have questions about what that exactly is supposed to be pointing to, but we'll put that aside, right, that because he also comes upon these these venues, these places, these locations that are mythic in that they're beautiful, but they're not just, right? They, they portend, again, they portend a deeper meaning and a deeper significance, and they have allusions to mythological experiences, like he goes to this island and it's alluding to, uh, you know, when his mother tried to show him a picture of uh, Krishna as the ultimate, and all of this stuff is sort of, uh, being um, actualized and put into association, but not in a, a clearly closed final form. It's no, it's it's a, it's left very things are very febrile and moving around, and so all of this is going on, and you're getting deeply engrossed with this whole thing, and then you find out that the story is actually, in a deep sense, allegorical that it's not an accurate depiction of what the boy went through historically. What the boy went through historically was actually an interaction with other human beings, and one of them was brutal, and aspects of himself, his own tiger uh, nature had come out, um, and you realize, oh, 
and, and, and in the movie, one of the characters sort of realizes this juxtaposition. And then the question, of course, emerges, well, why did you tell the story this way to me? And, and then there's the, there's the, the answer is given, well, this is, this is a much better story. Now, there's a part of us, a Cartesian part of us, that goes, well, how can it be a better story? It's not historically true. It's less. But the point is, the point is you actually understand all of this archetypal, mythopoetic processes that were at work in the adolescent, and you get a deeper participatory sense of the transformation within himself, of how he was connected to himself, and how he's connected to the world, and how he's connected to his religious heritage. You get that much more profoundly than you would get in a literal propositional history. And then you remember, this whole thing is an allegory. You're reading a story, or you're watching a movie, and within the frame, you're getting that this whole telling of his autobiography is a way of getting us to understand how we should think about God. We should be thinking about God, right, in the way in which the boy told the story, not so much as trying to capture the propositional literal truths. And so this is a distinction between a Cartesian notion of truth, which is accurate representations that literally, right, correspond to the world, and Heidegger's sense of truth is aletheia, which is to be in right relationship, coupled to reality in such a way that there's a reciprocal opening and reality can disclose itself to us insofar as we are receptive and we will identify with a transformation, a transformative response that affords it coming into existence. This is understanding truth as a process, a moment of truth. And so the whole story, therefore, like is a symbol of, and it's, it's designed to get you to enact, not just to think about. See, it's, it's, in its enactment, it's trying to get you out of the Cartesian framework. The whole point of the story is to get you to enact the, 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 the shift, almost a metanoia, from propositional truth to perspectival, participatory, transformative truth. And that that is the mode in which you can most properly ask the question about God. And I think that is a quintessential theme of uh, the argument I've been making in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, that the deep recovery, sati, of, uh, of the ability to shift out of a tyrannical, exclusive mode of truth into this perspectival, participatory, transformative one that is appropriate for talking about what is ultimately sacred to us. That is a profound claim that I have tried to support. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm not Heidegger or anything like that, uh, all right? But I've tried to support with argumentation because I think the ability to recover that in an enacted existential modal transformation is part of what is needed to recover from the meaning crisis. So I highly recommend um, Life of Pi for exactly that reason. And I think when you, many people love this book and they find it very hard, and this is not a criticism of them, but they find it very hard to articulate why they find it um, so good. And the fact that he, his nickname is Pi, the mathematical formula, and yet that mathematical Cartesian way of thinking, right, is being set right into a more encompassing framework. Like there's, it is, you see what I mean? It's so rich and it resonates and reverberates in, in a way in which only art and literature can. Look, I, 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 I speak, right, and I generate propositions and theories and, you know, and I'm a scientist and that's good, but there's a sense in which you, 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 I don't know if you've seen it. There's that movie, you know, uh, uh, contact where they send the scientist who's an atheist, and then and she's a scientist, and, and then she gets to that moment where she sees she's exposed, and she says, "Oh, they should have sent a poet." That's what I feel right right now, right? Uh, and so that's what um, I recommend um, for a way of trying to make a connection between the life of Pi. Uh, and the meaning crisis. 
I would also uh, point out that uh, Amar is putting together, and we've done some preliminary work on it, um, an, a, another series that uh, I potentially we're going to try and bring to fruition, COVID willing, at some point this year, Minding Media, in which myself and Anderson Todd and Leo Ferraro uh, will do this exactly this kind of thing, trying to see the deep philosophia within certain films and works of art, right? Minding movies, minding media, and, and, and to try and get them into dialogue with the meaning crisis. So I hope that uh, things will fall into place such that we can do that because I feel my own lack. And I'm not saying that with false modesty. I genuinely feel my own lack in trying to bring everything that's necessary to be said. Oh my gosh, that's even pretentious to say that, but you know what I'm trying to gesture towards, right? That that much more needs to be done by artists and poets. This is why Andrew Sweeney, um, getting into conversation with him has been so valuable. And so I'm hoping that I can move some way towards being responsible to that demand that certain things can only be properly disclosed artistically, poetically, poesis. It's also why I write with Chris, because, man, the guy is just, he speaks poetry the way the rest of us speak prose. Um, and, and it's a great gift. And I'm gifted to, to have his uh, profound friendship and collaboration. That was, a uh, that was a second really important question, and I wanted to address it at length. And I apologize for those of you who are waiting for your question, uh, but both of these, um, I, I think, have, uh, are, are pointing to things that are right on the cutting edge of um, what I'm working on right now and what I'm undergoing right now. So uh, we have another one from Lucas G, who's a patron. Hi, hi, John. Deep thanks for your work. I practice Tibetan Vajrayana meditation involving visualization, mantra, and... Um, shine, abiding in what is. If, if, if that's uh, a term that's been transliterated and I'm mispronouncing it, I apologize. Uh, what's your opinion of this type of practice in terms of its capacity for developing transparency, opacity, capacity, and an ability for agent arena shifts? Also, what, pr what practice am I missing in terms of keeping my biases in check? Um, so I think, um, and th this is again, something that, um, Again, it's right on the edge because I've been privileged uh, to be involved in uh, being an area committee who uh, supervising someone doing a PhD thesis, um, um, Max Trinan, uh, or, or, or he also calls himself Leaf, um, and he, he, it was on the thesis was on uh, Barfield, uh, sorry, on, on Goethe, Barfield, and Steiner, mostly on Goethe though, and Barfield. Um, and about this new way of seeing and what comes out in Goethe, especially in the way he was responding to Kant, because Kant put perception and imagination like as, as opposites, as distinct from each other, whereas perception was purely receptive and imagination was purely create, like purely projective and spontaneous, and they were therefore radically opposed to each other. And Goethe, in conjunction, by the way, with what uh, 4 cognitive science is increasingly showing said no they're actually like this they're deeply interpenetrating that in every act of imagination you're actually training perception and in every act of perception you're actually training imagination and they are mutually always self-correcting and so Goethe's new way of seeing was to, to explicitly try and bring that out I've only had a little bit of Vajrayana practice and so I do not want to be presumptuous I've read about it and I've talked to people about it, uh, so I have some sense. But the degree to which you are training that intertraining between imagination and perception, um, I think is very, very important. Um, and it's something that I think should be incorporated into any ecology of practice, a practice that is directed explicitly towards the interpenetration between imagination and perception. I think active imagination within the Jungian tradition does something similar. I think people who do work with lucid dreaming uh, does something, something similar. I think people who do uh, imaginal ritual practices like Tai Chi Chuan, like I do, uh, are doing something similar. 
Uh, because, I mean, in one sense, I'm imagining fighting, ten, it says in the classics, fighting 10,000 opponents uh, when I'm doing the form, right? So that when I'm actually fighting, there's no one there. And, and so the idea is I, I use imagination to train perception. And I'm, of course, using perception to train imagination all the time, the two eyes that I talked about earlier. So I think that's an integral part of any good ecology of practices. As to its capacity for developing transparency, opacity, shifting, of course, it's going to help facilitate that because you're training your attention uh, to zoom in and out and you're training it to zoom, if you'll allow me, up and down between top-down processing, which is what imagination is, and bottom-up processing, which is what perception is. So not only the in-out, right, you're also doing uh, the up-down, the gestalt feature, et cetera. So I think it's a powerful way of also training attentional scaling as well as training, sorry, all of attentional scaling, the up-down and the in-out. So that, that's very powerful. I, I think it, what am I missing in keeping my biases in check? You need to be doing a rationality practice. And people don't like, people, people will, that have come along with everything, they're just, oh no, what happened? This was all going so wonderfully. We were talking about imagination and perception and all, uh, and now he brings up rationality. Well, because what rationality, rationality doesn't mean, right? It doesn't exclude, but it shouldn't be reduced to, you know, logical management of propositional argumentation. Rationality is any systematic and reliable practice for overcoming self-deception. And the Vajrayana practices you mentioned, therefore, count as rational. But you need to have one that is specifically focused on this. You need to have practices that are designed to cultivate what's called active open-mindedness. You need to learn about all the individual cognitive biases. You can buy books on them that will teach you. These are what the cognitive biases are. And then you have to practice every day looking for a one bias, maybe the fundamental attribution error, may, maybe confirmation bias, maybe the bandwagon effect, right? Looking for those, catching yourself in them and actively opposing them, actively counteracting them. You need to become aware of the kind of biases that take root within uh, distributed cognition, like diffusion of responsibility and groupthink, etc. And right? Try to afford ameliorating them when you become aware of it. And you have to practice this, just like you're practicing your Vajrayana. You have to practice it every day. You have to, at the end of the day, write, write a journal. What biases did I catch? What, and then on reflection, oh, I was probably in that bias and I didn't catch it at the time. And do it in a, in a way in which you're befriending yourself, not judgmental or harsh, but also not lackadaisical. Because one of our most prevalent biases is that we are above average in our rationality. And we are way above average in our capacity to overcome self-deception. It's one of our most pernicious biases. So I, I would strongly recommend you take up a practice like that. And if you want a philosophical uh, framework that properly homes and valorizes it, I would recommend Stoicism to you. I would recommend Stoicism to you. Okay. So we have another question from Ben PR, who's a patron. Uh, thank you for helping me refine a little better my, my, my sense making of the darker and not to equivocate that with my scars while co becoming at transjectivity, if I have expressed that correctly. It sounds to me generally like you have. I have gone through a tiny transformation by realization. That's great. I, I'm happy to hear that. What is the correlation between the nervous system's neurological state and the phenomenology induced by psychedelics? Certain states within psychotechnologies and mental illness being perceived as religious or mystical experiences. Good. Establishing these correlations explain the possible efficacy of psychedelics when effectively used in the treatment of mental illness. Um, so that's an important question. Uh, first of all, Ben, thank you for sharing that you're going through um, what you call transformation by realization, which is a very nice turn of phrase, um, I might put it, I, I, if you'll allow me, I, I think you've put it very nicely. I mean, I hesitate always to, and, and because you allude to it, well, you more than allude to it, you state it at the beginning, like, I don't want to present these states as unequivocally, unquestionably good. I want to prevent, present them as powerful with, and I've tried to be consistent about this throughout, although at, at different times I give different things emphasis. These states are powerful 
And they're powerful in affording, like you said, transformation by realization, not just an insight in consciousness, but an insight of consciousness. But they are also powerful in that they can afford right? Massive self-deception, massive bullshitting of ourselves. They're, uh, uh, and also trigger thereby deeply defensive and reactive patterns. Um, so that's why I repeatedly argue that these experiences need to be set within a sapiential ritual context in which people have an independently running and, and, and supported ecologies of practice for dealing with the many ways in which we fall prey to self-deception and fall prey to reciprocal narrowing, etc. So all of that always being said, please. Okay. Let's then think about the correlation between the psychedelic experiences and right the, as Ben puts it, the religious or mystical experiences. There's a lot going on here and for those of you who've watched the series, I have I've presented this at conferences, uh, also on recorded talks, what's higher about higher states of consciousness, also a related talk about, uh, about uh, Gnosis, uh, and there's also uh, a t there's a, a, an argument running through uh, the episodes around the Buddha on higher states of consciousness and what is it going on in psychedelic experiences. Uh, that is conducive to this. And I'm writing, uh, currently writing a book with Dan Gregg and his uh, called The Cognitive Continuum from Insight to Enlightenment about and trying to show how there's a continuum between insight experiences, flow experiences, mystical experiences, higher states of consciousness, transformative experiences, and what we might stipulate to call enlightenment, which is a fundamental kind of uh, an experience that can power a state of seeing and being that is set into an ecology of practices, a wise ecology of practices that really affords addressing the perennial patterns and problems, the perennial patterns by which we fall into self-deceptive, self-destructive behavior. So there's a lot of argumentation out there that, that I've already presented on this. Uh, and. I don't think it is coincidental that these experiences often trigger uh, mystical and religious responses because I think religio, and I've tried to argue this independently, sort of I'm just gesturing at existing arguments, religio, when we enhance religio for its own sake into experiences of beauty and wonder and awe, and, and, and if we push it too far, we can fall into horror, all right? and we find them so positively valuable. I think that's the core of spirituality, of religion. Um, that's the religio part of religion, at least. And we celebrate it, and we, we do it for its own sake, precisely because what we're doing is engaging in the development, the actualization of the deepest potential of our relevance realization machinery uh, and our capacity for being in right relationship, deeply flourished, deeply flourishing couple, coupling to ourselves, to each other, and to the world. And so psychedelic experiences, when they are properly honed, have the capacity to put us into that state where we are experiencing something like beauty and wonder and awe on the continuum of insight, flow, a higher state of consciousness, the sense of being called in a transformative experience, etc. And, and that's why the empirical research, especially at the Griffiths Labs and um, also some of the work that Newberg is doing and some of the work that I'm doing with Jensen Kim and Michelle Ferrari and Jennifer Steller and Brian Ostafan about awe, all of it is pointing towards uh, the deep connection. But I'm going to return to this once again. I think it is a mistake to reduce this to just neurological states that have been created by the chemical interaction uh, afforded by the drug. I think a much more, a broader developmental dynamic understanding needs to be brought to bear to properly understand why you see this convergence. Because the convergence is not, I mean, there's some convergence of content, but the content, what people, the beliefs and content, other than other, like the, the metaphysical propositions 
I'm not talking about the propositions in which people are trying to articulate, right, when they're trying to articulate how they are coupled to themselves and to each other. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about like when when people sort of pronounce, well, the, the world has seven layers, or ultimately it's all just change, or there is a God, or there isn't a God, because all of these things come out uh, of these these uh, these experiences. So, but the universals are much more uni They're much more advers. They're much more not adversarial. Much more adverbial uh, universals. Like there's oneness, and there's deep hereness, and nowness, and connectedness, and beauty. And a sense of what then what's most important of it, a sense of hyper realness and a realness that demands change from me. I think we need we need to pay attention to all of that increasing uh, empirical evidence, both the qualitative reports and the more experimental work is being done. And so I, what I think we should be understanding is that if we do two things, if we understand these states, from a 4E cognitive science perspective, not just as neurological states, but as embodied, embedded, inactive, developmental, right? Sys developmental dynamical systems. And then we, and we also see that within the framework of a sapiential tradition, then we can get a good deep answer about why we see, we tend to experience a subset of these psychedelic experiences as mystical and religious experiences. So I hope that answers your question. It's a, another, the questions I'm getting today, and I mean this, and I mean this is complimentary, they're profound. And so I can't answer them by like, oh, ippy dippy dippy do, and here's how I answer you. I've got to give a, a long uh, answer because there's a lot that's at work in these questions. So uh, this question from Rob. Hi, Rob, who's also a patron. Is there anything like Stoic poetry that you'd recommend as the more poetic text to do Lexio? He's talking about Lexio Divina with. If there is not, do you have any Taoist or Buddhist source texts or commentaries that you'd like and why? And thanks, John and Amar, for all you do. Uh, thank you, for Rob, for thanking. It's, uh, it's always appreciated. Um, so there are a few sort of Stoic hymns uh, by, by Kalinesthetes and I think also uh, by Zeno to Zeus. Um, I don't know if they, you'd find those particularly powerful. Um, I, it, 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 uh, yeah, Stoic poetry, not too much of it has survived. I'm trying to think of a modern analog to it. Um, I, 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 I can't think of anybody that comes to mind. Um, there's a bit in, in Gerard Manley Hopkins um, that feels like a lot of um, how the Stoics sort of felt the vibrancy of the logos um, in reality. That's definitely the case, but uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins is a Christian. Um, uh, a, a Taoist text that's like that, I think the Tao Te Chen um, is really, really powerful. Um, but Sorry, I don't mean I don't mean to be disheartening. The Tao Te Chen has to be in order to do Lexio with something like the Tao Te Chen. Um, it's a good idea that you're doing that you be, are doing some Taoist practices as well, um, like some of the Qi Kung or Tai Chi. I've been uh, some of the Qi Kung I've been teaching, or uh, perhaps Tai Chi. Um, so if you want to start using the Tao Te Chen um, as a text or the, or the Shuangzi, I would recommend also, in addition to doing Lexio, I would recommend doing some appropriate Taoist practices as a way of properly setting uh, the intention for the Lexio and properly activating and actualizing the right mode uh, the right epistemic and existential modes for engaging with the text so that you can enter deeply into Lexio Divina. Um, I th perhaps, I mean, it's uh, Alcinius's book on the handbook for Platonism. It's on Platonism, from its, but it's also from middle Platonism, and therefore it feels a lot more stoic. It has a lot more stoic elements in it. Um, that might also be potentially valuable. I've done Lexio Divina with that, and found it valuable. Um, 
there are also um, there, are, there. I have a couple of the the, the anthologies. There's called sort of current Stoic writing, um, and perhaps some of that writing is uh, poetry rather than prose. You might want to check that out. You might want to also contact Peter Lindbergh, uh, my dear friend, who runs the Stoa, and he might have he might know of or be able to put you in touch with somebody who could give you a better answer to your question. So, um, Rob, that's my that's my best attempt to try and answer your question. Tostios is a patron as well. How to work with a punitive, tyrannical superego? Oh, this question is really right for me. Um, I, my, one of my dearest, deepest friends who has kind of access to the depths of my psyche, and I've written with him and collaborated with him, Leo Ferraro, um, uh, has told me that um, he thinks that at times I have a sadistic superego. And I take this very seriously uh, precisely because I was brought up in a kind of fundamentalist Christianity, uh, very, very punitive. Uh, it, it, you know, it, uh, uh, and um, it, it you know, tells you that you're born and through no fault of your own, you are diseased with original sin and there's nothing you can do about it. And all of your attempts to try, it, try and do anything about it are ultimately self-deceptive and self-destructive. And you're trapped in it. And there's nothing that you can do except feel very, very, very guilty all the time about it. And constantly abase yourself uh, to an authority and, right, that has absolute uh, dictatorship over you. And, and that, that, that's all you do is permanent genuflection uh, between... Uh, 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 sorry, permanent genuflection towards this being who who will save you even though you in no way deserve it. And I've talked about this in the series and how this, of course, is breeding ground, uh, really rife breeding ground for uh, narcissism uh, in our culture in very powerful ways. And the, why I bring it up, of course, is this kind of upbringing, man, does it, does it, does it put inside you a sadistic superego? Um, and so, and it's a very, it's, it's a very powerful thing. I, I'm, uh, I'm constantly having to note how it can get activated. And then I have to be careful around how it is making me reactive to certain ways in which people are talking or thinking. When I was doing the episode around Luther, uh, in the awakening for the meaning crisis, I probably if I was trying to be very self-aware. Some people said, you know, I I I I, I got a little too maybe angry sounding, but I, I want to. I mean, and I, I mean this respectfully. Thank God uh, for Paul Vanderclay because he had a very appreciative uh, and other Christians had a very appreciative response to that uh, that um, episode on Luther. It's a long preamble because it's an important preamble because I want to tell you, I want to make, I want to try and make clear to you that I deeply understand what you're talking about. I deeply understand what you're talking about. So how to work with a punitive, tyrannical mind is it can even at times be sadistic. Um, the Strombellas have a song, uh, We Don't Know I Believe It Is, and there's a part in the chorus where there's something in my mind that's killing me. Um, and I, I, so that, like, I really get what he's singing about there. Right? How to work with a punitive, tyrannical superego when engaging with one's ecology of practices. It seems to be able to uh, parasitize, excellent, excellent way of putting it, any practice with an imperative, forceful attitude, even in a recursive manner. You must not be forceful. Yes. Yeah, I know that. That, that the, 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 uh, the adaptive resiliency of these deepest, th these deeper complexes of parasitic processing. Yeah. Um, how does one break the cycle and afford an agapic compassionate grip on self-transformation? Well, first of all, the fact, and you're alluding to it, the fact that you're engaging in an ecology of practices is part of the answer, I suppose. I want to be really hesitant to, because I don't want to make it sound like, well, you do these four things and then, phew, you're free because I'm not under the hubristic illusion that I'll ever be free from this sadistic superego. Um, what I hope to do is ameliorate it somewhat reliably so, can I, so I can reduce the self-harm and the other harm that it drives. So that being said, um, 
engaging in an ecology of practices and you have to engage in it for a long time so that it becomes a, a, a correspondingly complex and adaptive and resilient entity that can wrestle right in a complex and adaptive and almost like a martial art fluency way with that parasitic processing that's ultimately the most fundamental answer uh, any sort of isolated technique i would give you or say to you now won't will be parasitized just like you you mentioned it will just be drawn in and taken up by this so that's I'm going to make use of a Buddhist framework here. That's the Buddha part of it, the, the, right? That, that, that participating in and deeply internalizing, a, you know, a counteractive dynamical system. I think you want to enter into um, the third thing, which is Dharma, which is, you know, learn more about um, from probably a psychodynamic perspective how there are various therapeutic interventions and interactions that can help you to deal with a sadistic uh, superego um, and, and try to incorporate that into your ecology. I, so this is where I think the psychodynamic domain uh, can afford uh, some very beneficial help. So I would strongly recommend you becoming more familiar with the work of my dear friend and colleague Anderson Todd about all of this aspect, uh, because I think you might find that particularly helpful. You might even consider that, and this doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you, right? You might want to enter into a therapeutic relationship just to get the dialogic right, um, response going. I, I knew that was uh, that was helpful to me. I, I went through Jungian uh, therapy in order to uh, uh, in order to wrestle with that. Um, and then Sangha. Joining a community of fellow travelers that can see your biases much better than you can. And this is what I keep saying that we should give up the idea of monologic reason. We should give up the idea of sort of the, the individual, which is not giving up individual responsibility. Individual responsibility, I've been, that's all what I've been talking about all along here. But giving up the idea of the self-enclosed, self-sufficient individual and that reason is a monologic treatise, right, blah, 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 right? But that our capacity for self-correction pales in comparison to the self-correction that others afford us if we enter into bounds of genuine, bonds, I should say, and also bounds, that works too, uh, bonds of genuine philia, genuine fellowship and friendship and a commitment to each other and a commitment to a process of reciprocal opening and the affordance and the celebration of the expressions of agape and connectedness and flourishing and insight and transformation like we're doing here now. So that's what's helped me. That's what continues to help me. And so I don't wanna give anything to you from rose tinted glasses. Um, I suspect there's a sense in which, so here's, here's the darker news. You'll probably be wrestling with this for a very long time, maybe all your life. But here's the good news. You can wrestle better, you can wrestle well, and you can ameliorate things a lot, and you can reliably reduce the self-harm. And I don't mean physically cutting yourself, I mean psychological, emotional self-harm. You can reliably reduce the self-harm and the other harm. And I really wish you well in that endeavor. Uh, because, as I said, I identify with it uh, very profoundly. I have been over the past few years um, and having to work on the Awakening series and all this other uh, work I've done with people has made me, because I've been trying to pull apart my appreciation of Christianity and agape from the way, the particular version 
um, that I was brought up. Look at what my hand is doing. Look at what my hand is doing. The way it traumatized me and raked and shredded me um, in powerful ways. And even saying that, I, I, I'm trying to let go of the tightness of the resentment and try to open up again. So I hope that's helpful to you. I hope that is really, really helpful to you. Okay, we'll be shifting to live questions from the chat. I want to thank the Patreon subscribers and everyone watching right now. Your support, of course, is very crucial to produce these videos and for supporting the science we're doing to find solutions to the meaning crisis. Uh, this is from uh, Self-Conscious Gilder. Uh, my first question, when I have a difficult time and I'm wrestling with myself, I seek guidance in people like you and the like. Where do you go to or what do you do in difficult times? Um, so I, I have, this, I, I'm, I'm trying to think about how to frame it. The fact that I sort of teach and lead a Sangha doesn't mean that this, look, look what's happened in my previous answer. Doesn't, that's also deeply helpful and nurturing and, and nourishing to me. Uh, so there's that. I turn to uh, people who are beloved. I turn. I turn. I. I am. I'm deeply grateful. I'm privileged to be in relationship with an astonishing woman, um, who's who's soulfully deep and beautiful. And I don't just mean physically. She's physically beautiful. But I. I mean, like she's beautiful. A beauty of mind and a beauty of spirit and a beauty of soul. And I. I've been with her now for close to five and a half years, and I can reliably turn to her, and she is deeply and often transformatively helpful to me. I have my son who is a constant companion, and he is the best um, at shooting little, uh, powerful little arrows to break any hubristic inflationary bubbles that are forming in me, so that's very helpful. I have fant a, a, fantastic, a fantastic set of friends. Amar is one of them. Um, who are just there for me reliably, and then I have I have the path, what I call the you know the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, um, and I and I have internalized uh, sages and saints around that. Uh, of course, really important to me, and I've two decades of work on this is that the work and play, serious play, uh, Socrates, um, and then um, also the whole Neoplatonic tradition. Uh, but great poets like Rumi and Rilke, uh, and, and great philosophers like Plotinus and Plato and Spinoza, I turn to them reliably, um, and they're there for me. Um, and I have turned, as I've said, to professional therapy um, when I felt really stuck in my life, uh, Jungian therapy. I both wanted to understand it, but I also needed to be transformed by it. And those weren't, those were actually deeply in sync with each other, chirotically in sync. So that's where I've turned to. Um, and I've been through this series, and right, the awakening, I've come to meet people that I've turned to, um, like Guy Sensok and Jordan Hall to get discussion. And even the people, like I've mentioned, that I work with who are also dear friends, like Leo Ferraro and Anderson Todd, and Chris, Master Pietro, um, I, I, I have, I, and I've been really trying to wake up to this uh, over the last couple of weeks. I, I have so much, so many people that I love and who love me deeply and who are supporting me in um, everything I'm doing. I, I feel uh, tremendously grateful and tremendously supportive. So I hope that answers your question. Um, so, uh, Ben Gao, I want to explain parasitic processing to a friend who seems to be suffering from it. Can you recommend a succinct article or video? Video. She does not have a cogsite background, but is in therapy. Um, yeah, if you can get there's a, there's a, a, there's a, a blog. So it's really popularized in the good sense of the word on this by Mark Lewis on reciprocal narrowing and addiction. So I recommend that. Uh, and then if she wants to deepen that, she can read his uh, 
his his autobiography, Memoirs of an Addicted Brain, so she can get a first person perspective on it. But I would strongly recommend the work of Mark Lewis, for sure. Especially that blog. Joyce Liu, hi Joyce. I find it hard to imagine imagine improvement during mindfulness practice. So there's a lack of direction during my practice. Can you help me imagine how the salient landscape changes, changes feel like? Um, so one of the things I regular, re regularly recommend is try is not to especially look for the changes in the practice. Arthur Dykeman put this really well a long time ago. It's not about altered states of consciousness. It's about altered traits of character. I think that's a, I, I, I come back to that again and again and again. Um, instead, try to pick up on where, as you're doing the practice, moments outside your practice where you've had an insight, where you've caught self-deception, and then, then answer your question. What did it feel like? What was my salience landscaping doing such that I became aware of my self-deception or such that I was able to, oh, I can enhance my connectedness here. <gasps> yes, this feels more real. This feels like I really understood her. We really connected. If you sit back outside, if you try to get a non-perspectival, non-participatory sense of this, it's not going to work. And if you try and realize it just in your meditative practice, chances are it's not going to take. What you're doing is facilitating the sensitivities and the sensibilities and the skills that will then germinate as an enacted virtue in your life. And when the, the virtue, in virtue of that virtue, you start to undergo these transformations, then look for the phenomenology. And I, I mean this seriously. Try to remember it at the end of the day. Celebrate it. Write it down. Not inflationary, but so that you can build up this felt sense of what it's like. And then that will start to carry naturally into the meditative practice. And it will start to go like this. So, intellectual, tile, which is uh, sort of, um, uh, I believe, an adjectival version of Aristotle's notion of an entelechy, um, asks, with all the focus on logos and intelligibility, was wondering what was the place of eros and Dionysian. Um, I think I take it you're meaning Dionysian in the Nietzschean sense rather than Dionysian, Dionysius, uh, the Areopagite, the, the really important uh, mystic. In the religion that's not a religion, what do you make of Nietzsche's the will to a system as a lack of integrity? Um, well, given that Nietzsche, we're <laughs> lacking in reverse. Um, uh, given that Nietzsche really exemplified that, um, and, and I think he really, there's a sense in which the notion of ecology of practices is deeply reflective of that Nietzschean sense of trying to get multi, many voices at work at once. My criticism of Nietzsche is he stayed at the propositional level, um, mostly, and therefore he tried to capture in a multivocality what I think should be captured in a multipraxis, um, so I think that um, there is a kind of integrity when you switch over to embodied practices and ecology of practices. It's not the integrity of systematic logical coherence. It's the integrity of a dynamically adaptive and involving self-organization. Um, now, I, the focus on, uh, there's been actually in some of the recent stuff I've been writing with Chris, um, Eros um, uh, the, the role of Eros within the Logos, which is a deeply Platonic notion, contra to, I think, Nietzsche's misrepresentation of Plato. Um, the Eros within Logos um, is something that Chris and I are um, writing about and exploring. So I think that um, the ability to break frame, which the Dionysian represents, is just as crucial as the ability to make frame which is what the Apollonian is, and you need a dynamical opponent processing between them. And I think there is always a relationship between Eros and Logos, but I think one of the things that happens when they, one of the marks of right relationship between Eros and Logos is that Eros doesn't get reduced to uh, just 
a, a static conceptual coherence. It's right. It is the evolving gathering together of things that come to belong together in a mutuality of enhanced and increasing relevance realization. And the eros is uh, transformed when it, it is no longer reduced to just the oneness of consumption. Uh, Plato talks about when the eros is brought into uh, right relationship with logos via the logos via the encounter with Socrates that the eros goes from being consumptive oneness to generative oneness that what the, the erotic impulse is transformed into I want when I encounter beauty I don't want to consume it I want to generate more beautiful things I want to generate beauty within beauty and so um, I think the relationship between logos and eros is uh, really fundamentally important. And we can see how logo, we can look for marks of right relationship within logos and marks of right relationship between them and between us and them and marks of right relationship in Eros. And when we see both of those, um, I, I think that's an answer to your question. And I think that also uh, is completely in sync with the Dionysian need to break frame and the Apo Apollonian need to make frame and how it's only the fluency between them that affords insight and ongoing dynamic adaptivity. Um, a, B, C, D, E, F. Um, do you have a tentative time for the book release? Um, I'm not sure which book you mean. Um, there, we're, Chris and I are working on an anthology on inner and outer di dialogos, dialogues. Um, if all goes to plan, go to according to plan, maybe. Uh, later this year, uh, the book, The Cognitive Continuum, um, I think that's also uh, maybe the end of this year, early next year. Um, Daniel is working really, really hard. And thank you all for who uh, helped with the Indiegogo campaign, uh, helped fund him um, during COVID so he could continue in-depth work on this. Um, the the uh, Those are the two ones perhaps that most readily come to mind. Perhaps you're also talking about the Metamodern Reader in which the chapter that Chris and I um, have uh, have uh, an article coming out. Uh, I believe that's going to be sometime later this year. Um, sorry, this is all very vague because um, I'm, I'm not quite clear which one you're referring to. And of those three, they come most readily to my mind. Um, as you can imagine, COVID has put all deadlines into this weird sort of space. Um, so I hope uh, that's an answer. So uh, sways of love. Can you explain Please explain and expand on what you mean from multiple realizability, especially referring to organic versus mechanical intelligence. Uh, thank you. Multiple realizability is this idea. Multiple realizability is, it's bound up with um, uh, terms we, we people use all the time without fully appreciating them. And this is the distinction between software and hardware within uh, computer, uh, computer science and computer use, right? So think of a program as software and think of how that program could be run on many different pieces of hardware. I could be running Word in this computer or this computer or this computer or this computer. I could even be running Word in on machines that are not built like uh, the standard computer is. I could be running it on something that's been organized like a neural network. Um, what it's made of can vary. Computers used to be much larger and have transistors, right? And, and now they have microchips. And so even the material, so the, the physical medium within which the software has to run, so the physical medium is the hardware. And the idea is I can run the same software on many, many, many different kinds of hardware made of many different kinds of physical stuff. And so it's a mistake to try to understand the software by looking at this particular hardware, right? So here's the software and I, oh, well, I'll look at how a Mac runs and that will make me understand how, what the, how the software runs. Well, that's not right because that same software can run in many different machines made out of many different things. It'd be like trying to understand chess, but you find people playing chess and let's say the, the pieces are made out of plastic. You say, aha, I know what I'll do. I'll study the material that the board and the pieces are made out of, and that will help me to understand chess. And you'll go, that's not going to get you 
chess doesn't work that way. You can play chess with pieces of plastic, pieces of wood. You can play it electronically. You can play it just with little marks on pieces of paper. It's multiply realizable. Now, what that means, therefore, is that you can't reduce the software, make it identical to any particular hardware. What this means, by the way, and most people don't realize it, is that there's actually a deep, people think that these two things go together and they're just whoa, really happy bedfellows, right? Uh, which is artificial intelligence and neuroscience. Yay! They're actually kind of opposed to each other. Because neuroscience says, well, I'm going to understand the mind by looking at a particular kind of hardware, the brain. And artificial intelligence says, no, no, that's the wrong place to look. You should be looking instead at the software because the software uh, is where you're going to under the, the, the hardware might turn out to be largely irrelevant, like the plastic of the pieces in the chess being irrelevant to understand chess. Now, I'm presenting these as extremes, of course. Uh, what that means is we have got to examine that very computational metaphor because, because first of all, it challenges the idea that we can simply equate mind and brain. But that doesn't mean that your mind is some uh, you know, ghostly thing that can float free from your brain. We you say, but I can move my software program around. You can, but you can never have software that's not running on hardware. I can't smash all the computers and then the software somehow floats into some metaphysical heaven. That's a deep mistake. On the other hand, as we move into cognitive science that is much more embodied and embedded and extended and enacted, we're coming to understand that cognition is not independent from biology, that there's a deep continuity. Now, it doesn't mean we can't have artificial intelligence. It might, but it tends to point towards this idea that if we want to create artificial intelligence, we're simultaneously and in integrated fashion probably going to have to create something like artificial life, life that is genuinely autopoetic. Um, so multiple realizability is is just a fraught topic, and it is just it's a central topic when I'm trying to introduce uh, cognitive science to people because it gets you deeply thinking outside of the uh, of our common sense obviousness about mind and brain. Oh, wow, that's way more complex than, than I thought it was. And then, and then once you challenge that common sense with the computational metaphor, you then challenge the computational metaphor with 4E cognitive science. And then you're very far from the cultural cognitive grammar by which we have always talked, at least since Descartes, about mind and body. And that's, what, that's where multiple realizability takes you. Okay, we've gone much longer than we normally did, and I guess Amar thought that this was just flowing wonderfully, and I always just uh, bow to his expertise and his judgment. I want to thank you for joining me in this Q&A. I guess many of you probably got a sense that I really got into it, and I found this uh, a very, very powerful session, so I want to thank everybody very much for that. Sorry we couldn't get to everybody's questions. Your questions will not go into the void. They will show up on the next Q&A. Some of you may want to bring them into uh, the Q&A at the end of the saying if there are more practical questions, and I'll try and address them there. We're doing these every third Friday of the month. We'll do another one in July. I, I, again, I want to thank all you supporters at Patreon. You help keep a lot of what I, I genuinely think is vital work going, um, and I deeply appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You can support my work on the meaning crisis by going to patreon.com mm -hmm. slash John Bervakey. And I do appreciate, I don't draw any income from this. This is all about the work. It's all about the work. Uh, we have a Discord server um, uh, where people are having some really interesting conversations. Uh, you can check the description in this video for the link. And we have a lot of people on there, like Paul Vanderclay, uh, Jonathan, uh, uh, so not Jonathan, Hall, uh, Jordan Hall, uh, 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 Greg Henriques has been there, Guy Senstock has been there, so many people. Um, that are on Voices with Raveki and, and up there, and uh, I name it Pascal. Uh, and so I highly recommend uh, going to the Discord server. And you'll just find a really vibrant community there, uh, vital discussion about all of, all of, sorry, it's not quite 
all of my work and everything that is sort of spinning off from it um, in a healthy fashion. A reminder that we're doing the meditation and contemplation sits every weekday morning at 9.30 um, Eastern time. And finally, I want to thank my dear friend and techno mage, Amar, my beloved son, Jason. They're always in the background helping me. And again, all of you. Thank you, one and all. Uh, goodbye. And I'll see you a lot from now. Take good care.